All right, so we're getting our participants are, are rolling in right now. Hello, everyone. Um, we're together today for an, another uh, Lunch and Learn on depression in the elderly. And we will get started in just a few minutes. I do have a couple of quick announcements as well. Hey, hello, hello. Um, glad to see that we've got so many folks today um, for our Lunch and Learn for Mental Health America, Spartanburg County. We're so glad to have you. Um, I'm sure that there will be more um, joining us as, as we go into the, the next few minutes. I do want to just make a couple of quick announcements and then I will introduce our speaker for today so we can get started. Um, First of all, I will be in the chat. I will be um, putting some links to not only the MHA Spartanburg website, um, also the Facebook page, uh, the email address for MHA, which comes directly to me, Maggie Ganey, um, and I'm the executive director. Um, and um, I will be putting all that in the chat. So if you need any further information about um, MHA or Lunch and Learns or any of our educational opportunities, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, we will also uh, be offering, as we usually do, continuing education credit uh, through Spartanburg Regional's Corporate Education Department. So if you're a counselor or social worker and you'd like to attain credits for that, um, I will put in the chat also the contact for that, which is Holly Cook. And you have to submit that um, information to her and pay your $15 fee before uh, September 16th. So keep that in mind. If you want credit, there is a deadline for that. Uh, so please, please um, look for that. And then you will also receive an email tomorrow um, that will have this, that information in it as well. So just in case you don't, you don't catch it in the chat, um, there will be that information coming to you tomorrow as well. I'm also going to put um, probably closer to the end of our, uh, our um, seminar today, a link for our next Lunch and Learn registration um, for November. So you will have that as well if you're interested in, in um, uh, participating with us again in November. And then during, during the um, presentation by Vanessa Thompson, I will be um, putting a link. Uh, it's a Google Drive link that will actually have all of her PowerPoint slides. Uh, so if you'd like to have those um, for your future reference, you'll be able to do that, as well as a, um, a, a couple of links for referral sources um, in our community. So, all right, um, I'm going to uh, introduce Vanessa. Vanessa is the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Spartanburg Regional. She's also a very active a board member for MHA of Spartanburg County. We're so excited to have her here today with us to share her expertise. Um, so Vanessa, I'm gonna just turn it over to you uh, to get us started then. Thank you so much, Maggie, for that uh, introduction. As Maggie, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, as Maggie stated, I am the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Spumberg Regional uh, Healthcare System. I've been here for about 35 years. I am board certified in uh, geriatrics and adult psychiatry. Uh, I still see patients in the clinic one day a week. And today, what I'm going to talk to you guys about briefly is depression in the elderly. How does it look? And then just share with you some of my clinical experiences um, that I see in the office. Uh, with that being said, I have no financial relationships. I don't work for any pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I do take their information and I just apply the evidence-based uh, practice uh, to my patients uh, that I do see. 
the objectives uh, for today is at the end of the presentation, you should be able to recognize three symptoms of depression in the elderly, verbalize the effects of depression in the elderly, and identify three medical conditions that mimic depression. And lastly, list three ways that you can decrease the impact of depression uh, in the elderly. Prevalence. I like to start all of my presentations out with the prevalence, uh, what it looks like in our community, what it looks like in the U.S. Depression is one of the most common mental disorders in the U.S., according to the CDC. Depression affects about 1% to 5% of the general population. Uh, but as you age, that increases a little. Uh, about 13.5% in the elderly if they require home health services, home health services, you'll see an increase uh, in depression. Also is about 11.5% in hospitalized patients. So what we try to do in the healthcare setting is to assess and screen for depression and try to intervene prior to the patient being discharged to whatever the next level of care is. Some of the risk factors related to depression is females. Females are twice as likely to have depression as males. Females outlive males. If you have any chronic medical illness, such as cancer, diabetes, or underlying heart disease, we know that with some of these diagnoses, the person uh, life expectancy is usually shortened. If you have a disability, Sleep really impacts the way individual feels. In my practice, whether it's depression, it's uh, bipolar disorder, if the person is manic, everyone that comes into the office will assess their sleep pattern. Uh, do you have a problem falling asleep? Uh, do you have a problem staying asleep? What does that sleep hygiene looks like? What we do see in the elderly around depression is that they have problems falling asleep or they have early, early morning awakening. They get up early in the morning. They say they just piddle uh, in the house. I just couldn't fall asleep. I had a lot on my mind. And the other thing that we see is just loneliness and social isolation. The question that I get a lot is how has the pandemic impacted depression in the elderly? In my office, it has gone way up. I see patients every day I'm in the office that talks about social isolation. They talk about being lonely, not being able to go out and do the things that they're used to doing. And the pandemic has really uh, expedited that. Uh, it has really um, caused a lot of depression. And we talk about that quite a bit uh, in the clinical setting. What is the impact of the pandemic on you? How has it affect you? How has it affect your family? The other thing is you may be at higher risk for depression if you have a family history of depression. So when we do our comprehensive intake, that's one of the questions that we usually ask. Do you have a family history of mental illness? Does anyone in your family have depression? How does that look? Certain medications we do know uh, causes depression. The beta blockers are one of the ones that stands out uh, in my mind. And if they have if the patients are on a very uh, complex regimen of medications, they also complain of depression as well. Uh, they talk about, I'm just taking too many darn pills, is what I hear in the clinical setting. If they suffer from some type of brain disease, traumatic brain injury, if they have Alzheimer's disease, uh, we also see uh, depression as well. Alcohol misuse of other drugs. As you guys are already aware, alcohol is a depressant. Uh, what I do see in the clinical setting is that the patients drink. Uh, they say what it does, it just numbs them so they don't have to deal with what's going on in their life at that time. Or they use substance. Uh, when I say substance, uh, the drug of choice that I see a lot is going to be benzos, Ativan. Uh, they use lorazepam, they use clonopin, they use Xanax, and sometimes they have other chronic diseases. Uh, they misuse or overuse or narco. Uh, the other one that I see in the clinical practice is going to be gabapentin or Lyrica. They misuse some of those medications. And um, 
the patients are also at higher risk if they experience stressful life uh, events such as loss of a spouse, divorce, or if you're a younger, older person, taking care of a loved one. Uh, I see that a lot as the uh, population age. Uh, you have family members taking care of their parents, and I see a lot of stress around that. Uh, so one of the things that I do in the clinical setting is that I try to interview the patient alone. If they have the cognition and they can tell me what's going on, I interview them and then I'll interview uh, the person that brings them into the office. And I can assure you there's always two different perspectives. Uh, and then I'll talk with the patient if their cognition allows, is it okay for me to share what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing with the family member? And that usually takes some time. Uh, it usually takes them about, uh, about 40 minutes to actually sit down and talk with both the patient and the family and come up with some type of comprehensive uh, assessment and treatment plan uh, for the individual that presents um, to the office setting with depression. Vanessa, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to, we did not, we did not address whether people could ask questions. Do you want uh, those questions to come near the end or is it okay if somebody has a question for me to check that with you? You can ask questions as we go along and I'll try to get to those questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions? If you wanna put them in the chat box for Maggie, if you just want to share if there's any questions. Yeah, I will. I'm I'm watching the chat box. There's also the Q and A, and I can pull that up if anybody chooses to use that. <clears throat> uh, some of the causes of depression that I do see is genetic disposition, uh, depressive episodes during younger years. If you had depression as a young child, and some we're seeing depression now in kids uh, age five and up, a lot of times when you get a little older, you will have uh, uh, depressive type episodes. Once again, the brain chemistry, if you have a traumatic brain injury, if you have Alzheimer's disease, just anything that affects the brain chemistry, it sets you up to have um, depression. And once again, stress, loss of, loss of a loved one, loss of independency, loss of a home, loss of a car or the ability to drive. One of the hardest things for me in the office setting is to tell a patient that they can no longer drive. That upsets them more than anything. Uh, and the reason being is that they become totally dependent on someone else to get them from point A to point B. And they feel like they are a burden on the family member. I have to call someone to take me to the grocery store. I have to call someone to take me to my uh, doctor's appointments. My children have lives outside of uh, dealing with me. And so a lot of that, uh, they feel like a burden on the family member. And of course, when I talk with the family, the family say, oh, it's not a problem. Oh, we don't mind doing this. I've told mother this 10 times that it's no problem. Between all of the siblings, we can take care of her. But in that individual mind, they still feel like they are a burden on uh, their family member. And the other thing is um, giving up their home or moving in with someone else uh, causes a major depression. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit, how you can ease some of that uh, as your um, as an individual uh, age. What do we know about depression? Uh, one thing that we do know about depression, many of the symptoms of depression are the same across all ages. And it can occur at any age. As I stated earlier, we send depression in five-year-olds. We send depression in uh, high schools, middle schools. Uh, and with the pandemic, we see a lot more depression, more so around social isolation and then just being away from their uh, friends at school and things of that nature. While depression is coming in the older population, it's not consider considered normal. Just because you get older, depression is not a normal finding. Do we see it? Yes, as the individual age, but it's not really a normal finding. Some uh, individuals can overcome the depression. Some of them are more prepared, but it has to do a lot with those life events and what's taking place in your life up to that point in life, how they handle and how they manage um, depression. 
for example, um, just had a couple of folks in our office uh, that lost their spouse to COVID and they were having a very difficult time uh, with depression because that individual did everything in the home, paid all the bills. They went to the grocery store together and the wife or the spouse did not, did not know how to uh, balance the checkbook. Didn't even know the numbers, the account numbers to get into the uh, check-ins account. So the pr depression in that individual was uh, escalated because of the loss and uh, being totally dependent and not able to carry out some of those normal day functioning uh, that they have done in the past. Uh, medical conditions, uh, folks with certain medical uh, conditions, they are more likely um, depressed. We do see that in cancer patients. We see that in patients with heart disease. And uh, we also see that uh, with patients that have any type of orthopedic issues that interfere with their ability uh, to walk, their mobility. Uh, we do see that. Some of the other things is regardless of how old you are when you get depression, what we need to understand is you can't just shake it off. Uh, I hear a family member say, why can't they just get over this? Uh, mother's been dealing with this for six months. It's been a year. Why can't they just get over it? It's a chemical imbalance in the brain. Unless you have treatment, it's very difficult to just get over it. Uh, it's what I spend a lot of my time educating uh, the patient and their families on. They can't get over it. If they had a choice, they would not be this way. One of the most common things that I do see in depression in the elderly is what we call anodotia or loss of interest. They just lose interest in the things that they used to enjoy doing. And so one of the questions that I do present um, to uh, the patient is what brings you joy? And then they'll list all these things that they enjoy doing. And my next question is, when was the last time you did these things? And that's how a lot of times I can uh, pretty much diagnose if they're really depressed when they stop doing those things that they enjoy doing. Uh, reduction in motivation or the ability to experience pleasure. I hear it all the time. I just feel numb. Uh, this doesn't bring me joy anymore. I just don't feel like doing anything. I don't have the energy. Uh, I just can't get up and do the things I uh, used to do. We call that psychomotor retardation. Uh, that's just that normal slowing. They have a slowing in movement. They have a slowing in thought process. And they have a, a slowing in just getting uh, the words out. And so when they have that psychomotor retardation, family members think the individual has Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that is one of the differentials in depression. I mean, with Alzheimer's disease, it's depression because you will see that slowing. It takes them a little bit longer to retrieve the information that's in their brain. But if you just give them some time, it will come. And they just look sad. They just don't want to move. And we're just like, oh, mother's depressed, father's depressed, aunt's depressed. Or they have some type of uh, neurocognitive impairment. They have dementia because they just can't get that information out uh, as quickly uh, as they have done in the past. Some of the symptoms that I do see when they present um, to the office, I have a nurse that actually does the uh, intake for me and we sit down and we go through some of these things. What they notice is a change in the mood. The energy level is really low. They'll spend all day in bed. Appetite, with the appetite, the appetite can increase or the appetite can decrease. Mother eats all the time, a mother's not eating anything. Dad eats all the time, a dad's not eating anything. So it could be either way. Just feeling flat or having trouble with positive emotions. Nothing brings them joy. They just don't want to do anything. Once again, we talked about the sleep, either too much or too little. Uh, they will have difficulty concentrating. They feel restless. They always feel on the edge. Uh, they're worried, they're stressed. I'm a burden to the family, um, and they just go uh, down that cycle. Uh, sometimes we see anger, we see irritability, and sometimes they just get aggressive. Stop asking me that question. I've already told you. And then the family will bring the patient into our office and say, hey, mother's not right. Dad's not right. What's going on? 
sometimes they have what we call psychosomatic complaints. One of the things that I do is I go back and do a chart review. And I'll be honest with you, what I do is I count how many times have they seen their doctors and how many times they have presented to the emergency department with something, headaches, GI symptoms, leg pain. So I go through and I count. And in my mind, I'm thinking psychosomatic complaint. So I do what I call a review of systems. If you're positive for every review of system that I go through, in my mind, I'm thinking, is this person depressed? If they have headaches, if they have chest pain, if they're anxious, if they have constipation, if they have diarrhea, if their joints hurt. So I go through my whole review of system. So if they have a lot of positives, not saying that they may not um, have those issues, but what I do see in the elderly, they have a lot of psychosomatic complaints. Um, the need for alcohol and drugs, we talked about that already, and just a sheer feeling of sadness and hopelessness. And so one of the other questions that I do go through when I get to the psych evaluation is, do you feel sad? Do you feel hopeless or helpless? And the answer that I usually get to that question is I feel uh, helpless because I can't do the things I used to do, but I'm not hopeless. Sometimes I get them both hopeless and I'm helpless. Uh, but the point being is that you have to ask the questions. And sometimes we feel like if we do present those questions is that the patient is going to take on that uh, mood or that, um, that experience. And that's not always the case. Suicidal ideation. Uh, one of the questions, do you feel like harming yourself or do you feel like hurting someone else? That is a red flag. Once they do say that, you need to move on to the next question. What is your plan? What I see in the office is that patients do say that they would be better off dead. Does that mean they want to kill themselves? No. They say that. I say, well, why do you feel that way? And what I get from that question is, I've outlived everyone in my family. My health is not what it used to be. I feel like I'm a burden to my family. Nobody comes uh, to see me. I said, well, do you have any plans of killing yourself? Oh, no, I would never do that. I'm a Christian. That's something I don't believe in. So just because they make that statement doesn't mean they're going to carry it out. And they'll say, well, I've done everything in life that I want to do. There's nothing else for me to do. So when the good Lord is ready to take me, I'm ready. And the other thing is engaging in high risk activities. Any questions? So oh, once again, I what I Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maggie, I didn't hear you. I just said, I don't see any in okay. the chat or anything, okay. Symptoms of depression, what I see in my office, the main symptom that I see is sadness. They just have an overwhelming feeling of sadness. I'm just sad. I'm sad about what's going on in our country. I'm sad about uh, being isolated, not being able to do the things that I used to do. I'm sad because uh, one of my best friends of 30 years have just passed away. I'm just sad because of my physical health. I'm sad because I can't just do what I used to do. Uh, and older people may not always admit uh, to being sad. Uh, and so if you go in and you just say, are you depressed? They usually say no. I'm like, well, tell me what's going on. Tell me what, what did you do today? Tell me how's the family's doing? Tell me about your home. The last time you was here, you said something about that you can't keep up with the housework. Uh, last time you was here, you told me that you stopped using the stove. How are you getting food? And so we just go through and start just talking about different things. And then as a family member, what you may uh, notice is just tiredness. Uh, my question is, what time did you go to bed and what time did you get up? And, you know, granted, I do think if you retire, if you want to sleep to noon, I'm good with that. Uh, but what did you do from noon until nine uh, the next night? So just getting a good thorough history of uh, how the day goes. Uh, and that's one of the, the questions that I do ask is, uh, what time do you get up? What time do you eat breakfast? What time do you have lunch? What do you do for the rest of the day? I sit on the porch and I watch the birds. I like gardening. Uh, and then they just tell me what's going on. And once again, sleep is a biggie. 
And sometimes what I usually see, they're just grumpy and irritable. Um, the family brings them in and say, he's just irritable. He's grumpy. He's never happy. Nothing seems to make him happy, no matter what I do. And once I get the patient along in the room without the family, uh, they'll just go through and tell me, you know, exactly what their thoughts and feelings are. And they'll just say, yes, I am irritable. I'm so darn irritable because I just can't do whatever. And then once again, the review of sy systems, if they have all those psychosomatic complaints, they go through that list. Uh, that is a big trigger for me. Other thing is I look at the medications. If they are medication for every system, uh, sometimes that's a red flag for me as well uh, when I'm going through my um, review of systems and my assessment of the individual. The effects of depression in the elderly, the mental decline is pretty rapid. And I think the word there is rapid. In Alzheimer's disease, it's not rapid, it's progressive. It's slow, uh, but with depression, it's rapid. They just don't get up. They have the self-care neglect. Uh, they don't uh, eat meals. They don't bathe. They don't keep the house as tidy as they used to. So uh, it's pretty rapid. So once you get them in and get them treated, a lot of times that improves uh, with medications and with therapy that improves uh, rapid. Uh, the turnaround is pretty quick is what I see. Uh, the patient can tell me the date, time, where they are. They can tell me who's the president, current events. Does it take a minute for them to get that information out? Yes, uh, but I just allow them time to do that, and they're able to tell me uh, the current events. Uh, and that's one of the differentials between neurocognitive disorder, Alzheimer's type, and dementia. Uh, if the patient is having difficulty concentrating, uh, if you ask the question, they'll tell you. Uh, I'm a firm believer behavioral health patients are pretty honest if we just ask the question. Sometimes we don't ask those questions because we don't want to know the answer. If you get the answer, that means you need to deal with it. The language and the motor skills, they do slow down. Uh, they can be a little abnormal, just normal slowing, just getting up, moving. Um, you will notice that. And then the patient, uh, when they come to the office, sometimes they're more worried about uh, Alzheimer's disease, they're worried about uh, neurocognitive issues. Do I have dementia? And a lot of times it's the underlying depression is what I see. So you just go through that process, that interviewing uh, skills. Hey, when did it start? How long have you felt this way? Uh, tell me what's going on in life, any stressful events and whatnot. So they'll start telling you, oh, uh, my family just told me that I may have to move in with them uh, because I've had three falls in the home. Uh, so when you start getting at that granular level, collecting that information, sometimes you can differentiate between if it's a depression or it's a, if it's a neurocognitive impairment, uh, Alzheimer's type uh, disease. So just getting that information is key. And a lot of times in the office, I just talk, how's the dog? How's Bobby doing in school? And then I get to the questions uh, that I need in order to make the diagnoses. Uh, older patients don't like for you to test their memory. So they get angry. Some of the medical conditions that mimic depression includes heart disease. We talked about that stroke. One of the things I do look at in our practice, if they had a CT scan or, uh, or MRI, and what I'm looking for on the CT scan and the MRI is just changes in the brain. If they have an infarct, if they've had a stroke, I'm looking at exactly where that stroke was uh, occurred inside of the brain so I can think about how the patient is going to present. If it's frontal, if it's going to be occipital, I start just thinking about what the brain uh, function is in that area. And then I can look at the patient to see, you know, if they're exhibiting some of those type symptoms. Cancer, uh, I think we've done a really good job with cancer treatment. They don't always look at that as a death sentence now. Parkinson's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease can be a little tricky. I don't always look for the tremors. I look for the rigidity if they're really stiff. Uh, I look for when they walk to the room, how they sit down in the chair. And of course, I look for the tremors, uh, but it's the rigidity is what you see before you see the tremors. A lot of times in the Parkinson's um, disease, 
uh, and the other thing with Parkinson's, I look for if they're having hallucinations. That's what I look for. Lupus, diabetes, when the blood sugar drops, the patients sometimes get a little, uh, well, they get confused when the blood sugar drops. And that's one of the things that we talk about as well. What time do you take your medicines? Oh, they told me to take my meds at 7 a.m. So I get up at 6.45, I take my medications and I go back to bed. Well, did you eat? Well, no, but you took your diabetic medicine. So the blood sugar drops, they get a little confused. So I say, well, take your medicine when you wake up at noon. Uh, twice a day is twice a day. It really doesn't matter what time you take them. If it's once a day, it's once a day, whether you take them at night uh, or you take them in the mornings is some of the education that I do do in the office. Uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, as already stated, depression is one of the differentials for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Multiple sclerosis, medications, um, just about every med that you put in your mouth uh, has a side effect. And what we look at is the side effect of the medication to see what we need to put, uh, put the patient on. The cardiovascular drugs, uh, the beta blockers uh, usually causes some depression. Some of the chemotherapy drugs, the antipsychotic medications uh, is what we use for uh, schizophrenia. Uh, we also use it for um, hallucinations, whether it's auditory, visual, uh, anti-anxiety medications. The literature over the years that I've been working with the geriatric patients, what we're seeing is that the anti-anxiety medications, whether it's lorazepam, clonopin, Xanax, those sleeping medications that um, we put patients on, the Ambien, the Rosarm, and uh, meds of that nature, they will cause um, confusion and they can mimic um, depression. Uh, hormonal therapy, and uh, just about any drug that uh, we prescribe for the elderly as we do age, those systems usually slow down a bit. And so the metabolism is going to be a bit different. So a medication review is uh, extremely important uh, when you're looking for depression uh, in the elderly. Other factors of depression in the elderly is medical issues. Retirement is a biggie. Uh, not only does re, uh, working, having a job uh, brings in income, it also uh, socialization, you have to get up and do something to get somewhere. And so uh, you're up and you're moving about. And so retirement, I do uh, hear a lot of patients in the office, they got depressed after they retired. And so what we do is we just talk through um, what can you do now that you're retired? Do you want to volunteer? Uh, what skill set do you have? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about going to, uh, I don't call it adult daycare. I call it, do you mind going to uh, a place where older people meet and then uh, that has the same diagnosis as you? I think that may be a good fit. Just trying to get them out of the house, trying to get them engaged in some type of activity, uh, especially around retirement. Retirement usually sets in three or four months after being retired, they're looking for something to do. Uh, all those grandiose ideas we have, travel, take care of the grandkids. Uh, what I see, you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, that wears off pretty quickly. Then they tell me they don't have anything to do or they never got to the things that they planned for retirement. Not all patients, but a large uh, portion of them will, do, uh, will tell me that. Um, just dealing with death. As you age, you know, sometimes we outlive uh, our family and our friends, and sometimes depending on that relationship, uh, elderly patients have a very difficult time with that, and uh, they will present with depression. Uh, but what I tell them is um, everybody grieves differently. So how you grieve is going to be different from the way I grieve. So just give them some time. And a lot of that has to do with the relationship of that family member and that friend. Having moved to a different location, that's a biggie. Once they get to the point they can't take care of the home, uh, things are getting overwhelmed. Uh, we think it's always good to move them to a different location for safety. Uh, but what we have learned is that older people tend to adapt better if we have life trials. Uh, that means I'm going to let you go live with Maggie for uh, a week to see how that goes. 
when you just uproot them, move all of their things out, that's when I see the depression sets in. So sometimes um, if you just sit down and say, what do you think is best for you? Uh, it's not us. Sometimes we think about what's best for us uh, instead of what's best for the individual. Uh, and sometimes the elderly patients uh, come up with a good plan. Do they like people coming into their homes? No, <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> then eventually they'll get to the point where they'll let um, a aide or somebody to come in to help with light house duty, cook meals and things like that. But initially, uh, they're most of the time they're resistant. But if you can talk them into one day, then I'm like, oh, if they did good, can they come in another day? Next thing you know, they have somebody in the home three to four days a week, but it's a trial with the one visit or the two visits, and then just let them move up uh, to having someone in the house three to four times a week. So um, just be mindful um, to that. So um, this is a question for everyone in the audience. I don't know who's in the audience. Uh, if you have experienced several of the following symptoms for the past week, you may be su suffering for, from depression. And some of those are persistent sadness. If you're anxious, are you feeling empty? Loss of interest or pleasure in hobbies and activities. Feeling of hopelessness. If you're pessimistic feeling of guilt, decreased energy, fatigue, to slowing down. If you're having problems remembering, making decisions, difficulty with concentration, once again, the sleeping, you're oversleeping, undersleeping, appetite, increase, decrease, unintended weight loss, thoughts of death, suicide, restlessness, irritability, aches, pains, headaches, cramps, digestive systems. If you have um, several of these symptoms, do your own little checklist in the audience. Uh, you may be uh, feeling a little depressed and it's okay to feel that way. Uh, just make sure that you seek help. Uh, it will improve uh, with treatment. So now that we know what depression is, I just want to talk to you briefly about the types of depression that I see in the elderly. Uh, major depressive disorder, persistent um, depressive disorder, seasonal affective disorder, and the psychotic uh, depression is what I see. Major depression is usually the most common one that I do see in the office. Uh, as it says, it's the most common type of depression in the elderly. Uh, it may occur during your younger years. Uh, it may reoccur when you get a little older. And it's, um, the symptoms include the sleep, the concentration, eat, work, and then just the inability to enjoy life. And with this depression, you may have it continuously throughout life. It may get a little bit better than something happens and you get down a little bit. So major depressive disorder, this is the number one that I see in the office. And usually for the treatment, we put them on an antidepressant and they usually do well. And the antidepressant that we choose is going to be depending on your medical history, which your primary care physician says, and then we can go from there. Uh, it's usually going to be some of the older ones like Zoloft, Lexapro, Celexa. Uh, a lot of the new ones, it's not always covered by your insurance uh, plan uh, when you get a little older and you have to fail treatment before they'll give you some of the new ones that you see on um, TV. Persistent depressive disorder. Uh, this is the same thing as dysthymia. It's a, it alternates between mild and moderate depression. And some of the symptoms that I see with a dysthymic disorder, I do have some patients with this. It's just sad, sadness, hopelessness, feeling of guilt. Uh, usually it occurs every day for about two years. They worry about the past. One of the questions that I do ask, if you have a do-over in life, what would you do different? Um, just about every new patient that I see, I do ask that question. If you had a do-over in life, tell me what you would do different. I'm not going to tell you the answer <laughs> that I get to that question. 
And some of it has to go around with, I wouldn't have married this man if I knew he was this way, uh, Miss Vanessa. Uh, and then the symptoms range in severity, but I do have some with uh, dysthymia. And what usually happens with this group of patients, we put them on uh, antidepressant, antidepressive, and they're on that medication for life. Seasonal affective disorder. Do have some patients with this, not as many, but most of them come in and they'll say, I think I have seasonal affective disorder or what we call SAD. Uh, this occurs when the weather gets cold and gloomy. So as we go into the winter months, you'll see this. A lot of times it has to do with the short hours of sunlight. Uh, the symptoms are the same as for chronic or clinical depression, uh, but when the weather warms up and the sun uh, stays out a little bit longer, these symptoms usually go away. Uh, with seasonal affective disorder, typically uh, it's, it, 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 it usually occurs, uh, the patient has social withdrawal, increase in sleep, they have weight gain, uh, and then like I say, as the season change, it usually gets a little bit better. Uh, they go out, they get their walking in, they lose the weight, the sleep cycle works, uh, improves. And the other thing is sometimes they'll do artificial light uh, for this. They'll get one of those UV lights for the home or they'll make sure that they're opening the blinds and whatnot in the home so they can get more light uh, in, the, in the house. Psychotic disorders, these patients here usually end up uh, in the hospital. If you have a psychotic disorder, depression. Uh, these are the ones I actually admit um, to Tower 7 at our Mary Black campus, which, are, which is our geri geriatric psych unit. Uh, this is what we see here. Usually uh, they experience symptoms of major depression along with other psychotic symptoms. Uh, psychosis may be in the forms of hallucination, delusion. Uh, they think that someone may be breaking into their homes. They may be hearing things, seeing things. That could be auditory, visual, or olfactory, smelling things. Do have a patient always smells like somebody's pumping some type of chemicals into the home that's coming from the attic. Uh, I do hear that one quite a bit. Delusions may be manifested by feelings of guilt, punishment, worthlessness. This here is very hard for families to understand. They accuse the family of stealing their money. They always say somebody stole my money or uh, my family took this or my family took that. And for the family member, they take that personally. And it's not personal. It's a chemical imbalance in the brain. Once the family realize what's going on with the patient, sometimes they're a little bit more accepting. But a lot of times they just get so frustrated that I'm going to take mother to my brother's home, let him see what's going on. Uh, we just have to be mindful. That's part of the illness. Um, somebody's still in my clothes. Uh, the money thing is what I hear a lot. Uh, and then families bring in receipts, checkbooks, and all of this stuff and show me where, you know, they spend money on this. That's part of the illness. Uh, and that takes a minute for the family to understand where we are with the disease. Um, and then that they fear that something is going to happen or some negative or somebody's going to harm them. I do see that. Uh, and of course, this can be caused by a traumatic event. Uh, if they have already had depression in the past from something, sometimes it'll exa exacerbate uh, when they get that psychotic uh, depression. And like I said, depending on what that um, hallucination uh, is, uh, what that psychotic symptom is, uh, a lot of times we end up admitting them to the hospital uh, to get them on the right medication so we can get them uh, home. And they usually do well. What can you do prior to the referral if you know someone that has depression or you think someone um, needs some help, needs to see a provider because they're depressed? Well, number one, I say a lot of this has to be done by your primary care physician uh, because we have a limited number of psychiatrists in this area. So some of the things that you can do uh, prior to the referral is make sure that it's not a medical condition uh, that's causing the depression or the symptoms that you're seeing. So what I would recommend, uh, they do this just about every time you come into the hospital uh, with a psychosis, you're going to get lab work. Everybody gets a CBC, T, T, uh, CBC, CMP. Every now and then I'll see a T, TSH, but they will do a, 
B12 in the hospital, we'll check a vitamin D level and any therapeutic drug levels that the patient's on. If they're taking uh, viproic acid or Depakote, uh, which is a mood stabilizer, we will check those. If you're on lithium, any drug with a narrow therapeutic window, we will check those to rule out anything medical. Uh, I'm a firm believer medical trumps behavior. So rule out anything medical before we give them a behavior health diagnosis. Check a urine. You guys know that when older patients get a urinary tract infection, sometimes they get really confused, they get agitated, and some of them will uh, present like they're depressed, they become withdrawn, they slow down, that sleep cycle uh, is impaired. UDS is a urine drug screen. They all get a UDS. Um, see what's in the urine. A lot of times I see uh, opiates and benzos in the geriatric patient. Uh, and that's from the medications that they're prescribed. Uh, what we can do is start treatment. Uh, we can put them on an SSRI, which is an uh, antidepressive, or we can put them on an SRNI. Uh, avoid benzos if at all costs. Um, it just really slows the brain down and increased falls and whatnot. So if we can avoid the benzos, if you're gonna use them, do I think there's a place to use them? Yes, but it needs to be short term. It needs to be limited. Instead of giving them a 30 day supply, uh, maybe we can just give them enough for two weeks. And if they're over that initial crisis and then we can move on. Uh, we do use a lot of scales. Uh, most of the patients get a PHQ-9. We're looking for depression. And we do a GAD-7, that's for anxiety disorder, just to see where we are. Most of the patients who are depressed also have anxiety. Uh, and the SSRIs, uh, usually if it selects a Lexapro, it usually treats uh, both the depression and the anxiety. Vanessa, I just want to let you know it's um, 1248. So we've got about 12... Uh, I think this is this may be my last slide. Okay. <laughs> so uh, brain changes in the elderly. What I'd say a lot is that this is a chemical imbalance. What we do see on a CT scan, uh, the brain, uh, what we see is their uh, losses in the gray matter and the volume may be down and there's some uh, prefrontal cortex. Uh, plays a high role in the thinking and things like that. When we see um, a CT scan, a lot of times in depressed patients, uh, we may see a smaller uh, area in the brain, in the hippocampus that has to do with the memory and whatnot. Uh, we do see that, and of course, the stress hormone. Uh, this is actually, I think it's the last slide. Um, what we do see on a PET scan with patients who are depressed, if you look here to, on my left, this is a person who's depressed. You see, it's not as bright. You see all this yellow over here? When a person is depressed, this is how the brain look versus a person who's not depressed. You see how bright all that activity that's going on. We see a lot of slowing and whatnot. And you see here, smaller uh, here, so these are some of the changes that we do look for. A lot of times when you put them on antidepressant, we can get you back to where it's all bright and it's all, uh, it's all lit up, okay? With that being said, I'll stop right here to see if there's any questions. I think the next couple of so slides is gonna talk about grief and the difference between de uh, depression and grief, uh, but I'll stop here uh, since I have about 10 minutes to see if there's any questions for me. I know that was quick. I don't see any questions yet, but um, I will put in the, the chat the um, therapist finder uh, for, from Psychology Today website this for, um, for patients that uh, would benefit from counseling in addition to medication. This is a really good way to search for a therapist in your community based on your insurance and your location, et cetera. And Megan, that is really good because I use that a lot. And if you put in exactly what type of therapy you need, what they'll do is you can put it in by your zip code. And a lot of them will do a FaceTime. If you're proficient at FaceTime and um, able to use your, the electronic devices, uh, you can do that. Okay. Any questions, comments? I know that was quick, but I'm always a phone call away if you guys need something. 
uh, but I do say give me at least 12 to 24 hours to give you a call back, but I will respond. I'm usually a little slow um, to respond based on everything that's going on in the hospital as it relates to COVID. Uh, just been really, really busy. I'm also putting in the chat the behavioral health guide from the United Way of Piedmont, um, which is an, just another resource for uh, community <clears throat> resources for therapy and behavioral health. Um, and I do use that a lot. Okay. That is an excellent resource. It's very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments, experiences that anyone has had that they would like to share. There's just a thank you. Thanks for all this info and MHA support for all of us. So, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and put the um, link for the November. Uh, lunch and learn in the uh, chat as well. So if you're interested in going ahead and uh, signing up for that, there will also be a survey that will pop up after this um, presentation is over from, from Zoom. So feel free to uh, give us feedback. That would be really helpful. Let's see, we have a question. Um, my husband has been on a rather intense regimen for an infection. Depression has been noticeable. That's what's a, more of a comment, but is there anything you want to say about that, Vanessa? Uh, if I heard you correctly, you said that my husband has been on an, inti an, an intense regimen of antibiotics for infection and yeah. the depression has seemed to worsen. Yes. Okay. That's common. That's pretty common. Just be mindful that medical trumps uh, behavior. And once that infection clears up, you may see an improvement uh, in their depression. And secondly, just make sure what antibiotic they're on, if they're on a antidepressant that we're looking at uh, EKGs, because some of the uh, antidepressants prolong the QT interval. And the antipsychotics, just make sure they're just eating and sleeping and doing some of the things that they enjoy in life. And if they're in the hospital, we have a consult team. We'll be happy to come and take a look at them and make recommendations. Any other questions or comments? Just um, want to remind everybody that if you're interested in, if you're a counselor, social worker, therapist, um, interested in continuing education, if you'll scroll up in the chat, you should be able to um, see the information about how to access that. Your the deadline for that is September 16th. So um, and and note note that tomorrow you'll receive an email that will also have that information in it. So don't hesitate to. Um, look for that as well. Do group conversations have a positive effect with depression? That's a question that just popped up, Vanessa. I'm sorry, Maggie, I didn't hear that. That's okay. Um, do group conversations have a positive effect with depression? Absolutely. Absolutely. The more you can engage and get an individual to talk about their feelings, uh, it's really impactful. And sometimes that's just what they want you to do. Uh, group therapy works excellent if you get, get them in a group therapy type setting. Where do you tend to refer for groups? Actually, we have group therapy in our office, and so I just refer to the therapist in our office, okay. and um, sometimes I'll refer to Emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, I use them quite a bit in this area, and also we have some private therapists in this area uh, that takes patients as well, 
and that resource from the United Way has a lot of that information in there. Very good. I've had a lot of requests for um, therapy. Um, let's see, one more question. Or uh, we are a rural area. Is there a resource for assistance? I really can't answer that one, uh, Maggie. I know there's grants and things out there that will assist with that. Yeah. And I know in like the Union area, I, I know there's resources in Union. And I think it's some in Cherokee, but the Spunberg area, I'm not 100% sure. But I'll try to get that information for you and um, get it to you, Maggie, and you can share with the group. Okay, yeah, I'd be glad to. Absolutely. I think churches too, um, are a good place to go in, in asking about resources, um, not only for assistance with um, paying for services, but also sometimes they have, they offer support groups as well. Um, I do want to just say um, thank you so much to Vanessa. Uh, this was really wonderful, Vanessa, good information. So thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your time. Great information is, this is a comment, great information. I'm experiencing many of the symptoms, but working through them. Grief is a biggie. Grief is a biggie for a lot of people, um, for sure. Right. Thank and you. The, the thing with grief that I did mention on grief, grief can last uh, anywhere from three to six months sometimes a little bit longer in the elderly. Once it goes past that point, um, sometimes we can look at something different, uh, but everybody grieves differently depending on that relationship. Um, I also do want to just mention that we have a symposium. Um, it's, it'll be virtual this year, um, coming up in October, October 21st, and you should see um, our flyers going out about that very soon. Uh, so please take a look at that. That's a, it's a, it's a offers uh, five, I believe five and a half credits of continuing education. We've got uh, five different um, presentations and anyway, it, should, it looks like it's going to be really good. And I will um, be sending out the flyer for that very soon. So, all right. Well, thank you all for your time. We'll see you again soon.